Mort, Saul, and Sam were very close friends also. And I don't know if you know, but Mort was meant to play Quill in Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. But he was also um, a very important uh, comedian and stand-up comic and, and political analyst. And um, while, he would, while he accepted to play the role of Quill, he, um, um, he got, he got a, 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 a tour. I don't, I don't know if it was a touring thing or he was, had, had a, some, some kind of commitment in a club and, um, and could not play the part. And, Sam, and called Sam and said, and no, actually wrote a letter to Sam and said that he couldn't, for, for, he couldn't play Quill after all. Sam wrote him a, le a letter in response, um, which was far from uh, uh, friendly. And uh, I remember Mort Saul sent him a, a, a wreath of black flowers and, and said the relationship is over. But Sam, Sam has a loyalty to people that go beyond the bounds of norm, normal, no, normal relationships. And he loved Mort Saul very deeply. So I don't think he would, it was a part-time dysfunctional situation. It didn't, it didn't follow through from the rest of his life. They were friends until he died. Well, when were you first, when were you first a aware of Peckinpah's um, personality talent, and b when did you first come across him? I met Sam in uh, 1960. Uh, I uh, had just uh, incorporated a production company in uh, uh, a picture company, and Stanley Colbert, who was an agent of William Morris, uh, came. Uh, came to me and he said, I, I'd like you to get a hold of a, a property called Castaway by James Gould Cousins and Sam should direct it. And Sam came up to see, meet me at my house and he, it was very misleading. He walked in uh, totally manicured and barbered and uh, with a suit on, quite dapper, quite a dapper individual, you know, when he wasn't uh, on the frontier. <laughs> but of course he looked upon the whole world as, as a frontier. And we had a great talk and unfortunately, the movie didn't get made, but we became friends. And in the process, uh, they ran uh, Ride the High Country for me with uh, 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 Joel McRae and Randolph Scott. And I was uh, really beguiled, you know. You're always beguiled, you know, when you run into an American in America. It's so rare these days, now that we're a third world country. Um, uh, what was it about Ride the High Country which struck you as unusual? Well, the picture, the picture was totally honest. I mean, people were tempted by do, doing the wrong thing, but they ch chose to do the right thing. And McRae, who was really a cowboy, and Scott have never been better. And Sam worked uh, totally uh, on uh, character. And this was, uh, you know, 1959, 1960, is before people were intellectualizing about movies. Uh, Sam used to sum that up by, we'd walk by a newsstand, and he'd say to me, just a minute, I want to, buy film quarterly and I'd say why are you buying film quarterly he says I want to find out what my last movie was about <laughs> so he was good and rise did you do you perceive a, a difference uh, looking at ride the high country with those old western values and say wild bunch uh no the values are uh, uh well what would the liberals call it male bonding uh, what they would, uh, male bonding only comes about after you've run out of women to look for, but <laughs> I think, but uh, you know, back to, to Sam, uh, no, I think it's all about loyalty. I still remember, uh, uh, Holden lecturing, uh, uh, uh Warren Oates and, uh, and, uh, Ben Johnson, the brothers there about that. If you, if you, um, if you, if you leave a man, when a man falls off his horse, if you don't go back to get him. You're nothing but an animal. I still use it as a metaphor for uh, my own adventures in Los Angeles and in Washington as well. Uh, he's quite right. I mean, the whole idea, the whole idea of, uh, of loyalty. The whole, and, and to Sam, loyalty was not an impossible ideal. It was all that would redeem you if you practiced it. I think he believed that. What do you think about his attitude to women? Because he seems to take a very hard one. Well, you see, he was very selective. He wouldn't use that with me. 
In other words, if he had a Rolodex for his uh, his wild parties, I was on the C list. I was, you know, he didn't do any of that with me. Uh, he was, um, uh, he was a, he almost talked like a, a romantic to me. And uh, he, um, uh, I know he, he was downright courtly toward, toward my wife, uh, China. And uh, I always found him to be a, a romantic. He may, have, he may have represented himself otherwise, but he also said, uh, you know, I'm a whore, I go where I'm kicked. I didn't find that to be the case uh, at all. I, you know, I, I found him to be an American. What happened after your, your meeting in the aborted project? You kept in touch. Yeah. yeah, we found something in each other. We brought out the worst in each other, Sam used to say. And uh, he would show up. I'd be working in some obscure nightclub and he'd show up and be in the front row. And uh, I'd go to the movies. Well, I had a television show here in Metro Media in 19... 66 and I went on a personal crusade for three movies one was the Battle of Algiers Gilo Ponte Corvo uh, the other was the Wild Bunch and uh, and I should say the third was the professionals Richard Brooks and I went on a, I went on a personal uh, crusade and that that just cemented the relationship with Sam even though Phil Feldman who produced it and I were friends we're not friends the way Sam and I were I mean, uh, I saw Sam as, uh, uh, I've never said this in public before, I don't know if anybody wants to hear me say it, I consider him the moral successor to John Ford in American movies. Um, how was he perceived by the Hollywood establishment in the early stages? Well, uh... I would say uh, probably eccentric, but you don't get that much space in the early stages. I mean, the early stages when he was writing a show like uh, uh, when he was doing The Westerner, the the producers all thought he was crazy. He took he took E. Jack Newman and uh, a couple of the other uh, producers and took them on a trip to Mexico to find what he liked to call the truth. And of course, the upshot was that they all broke up with their wives because of following their tour guide, Sam Peckinpah. But he, um, uh, uh, they also were all beguiled at his artistry. The Western, Dave Blassingame, the lone cowboy, the last American, whether he be an astronaut or a cowboy, a guy alone trying to find out what's on the other side of the envelope. The guy with a dog he doesn't feed, which went on into uh, Hondo. And although people uh, clasp Louis L'Amour to their breast, Sam is really the original uh, spirit of all that. And he was, um, but he was always wild. I mean, when he was living out in, in Malibu, he was starving, so he decided to write a show for uh, Father Kaiser on that series uh, called Insight. And his particular sadistic sense of humor was that um, they called him about the show so they could put it into work. They said, if you have any notions about the show? And it was Good Friday. And Sam, who I thought was notoriously irreligious, said, how dare you call me on Holy Friday? He had an argument with the producer. The producer, of course, who was a Catholic, said, first of all, it's Good Friday. It's not Holy Friday. But meanwhile, he'd been sucked into the vortex of, of combat with uh, Sam. And uh, uh, Sam just decided to play a game with the guy that we shouldn't be talking about barter on, on the Lord's Day. But the fact of the matter is he didn't think much of uh, religionists, if you will. I uh, substituted for Merv Griffin at CBS. And one Friday night, I did a discussion of where is America going? And on the panel were Sam, uh, Pat Weaver, Hugh Hefner, uh, Tom Redden, the Los Angeles police chief, and Reverend Rex Humbert. And Sam went by everybody and started to go after uh, the Reverend saying, you know, I can't forget, you know, you guys waving live snakes over my head and, and uh, accusing me of original sin. See, but Sam's joke on the world was that he thought he was guilty of actual sin, not original sin. It didn't have to be secondhand. No hand-me-downs for Sam. This uh, desire of his, or need of his, always to fight, produces <laughs> for them. Can you talk about that? When the, what was that? Inbuilt? Was it learned? 
What do you think about him? The sense of combat? Well, uh, he thought if people were good, Sam thought if people were good, if they had character, they would fight their way through the ashes. So uh, he'd go 15 rounds with them. He'd spar a lot. He uh, basically, I, the side of him I always saw was that he uh, idealized people. He'd throw a challenge at you, you'd fling it back in his teeth, and then he'd turn to the imaginary audience and say, did you see the way she came back at me? She's fantastic. Forgetting, of course, that he had, had, had provoked them. But what he was trying to do was get a more uh, a truthful moment. That made him fight with ticket agents at airlines, and waitresses and restaurants, <laughs> and all that. And, uh, and actors. But I mean, you have to look at the work. You have to look at the work. I think the collaboration with Steve McQueen is better than anybody else ever was with Steve McQueen. There's a couple of pictures to prove it. It's the work. The work, I have to remind everybody watching the show, the work is romantic, it idealizes women, and it's essentially heterosexual. That is a man's approach to his destiny, to do the right thing regardless of what it'll do. What he usually does is the right thing. It changes him for the better. That's what I see whenever I see those movies. That's why I like Junior Bonner, and that's why I like The Getaway, and that's why I watched The Wild Bunch last night. Again. Do you think there's a, one side of him, a, a more, if you like, sentimental side of Cable Ho, and then there's the violent, poetic side of Wild Bunch? Were they ever brought together satisfactorily? Well, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't know if I'm really equipped to be that much of a, uh, a film student to really analyze whether uh, he ever uh, fused those disparate sides of his nature. I don't know. Uh, I don't know that much about it. I, I know what I get when I see it. He was not an intellectual, so that means his heart. It was all from his heart. And he, Sam was very pure about America. I saw him as a 1939 American. Sam was conning Hollywood by supposedly playing by the rules when he had different origins. So. He wouldn't say to them that he believed in a moral resolution with a gun down Main Street to get the bad guys. He'd say he's in psychoanalysis. The liberals love that here. And he'd say uh, uh, that Harry Truman was the greatest underappreciated president this country ever had. So he sounded vaguely like uh, a liberal Democrat. And, uh, uh, and uh, so he was on the side of the angels. Uh, but the fact of the matter is when he, when he wrote a script with you, He'd say, after the gunfighter gets shot in the back, let's make sure we, we uh, let the audience realize that the undertaker tries to take the gold out of his teeth before he buries him. And let the undertaker do it in the shadow of the town church. That's the kind of things he taught me about writing. And because uh, uh, I wrote briefly out here for a few years. Um, that's the point he wanted to make, but he was, uh, he was in the tradition of telling the truth, but he wanted to make sure that um, he didn't scare his masters out of hi hiring him. So he didn't stress or even uh, acknowledge that his, his brother was the hanging judge of Fresno <laughs> and, uh, or any of that, because he believed in heterosexual masculine determination, not to be redundant. That's what he believed in when I talked to him. Are there things more that he might have taught you when you were writing, collaborating together? Sam was his own writer, but he would hire writers because he was lonely. He wanted somebody to talk to, drink with, and have his own army on the set. When you used to arrive at a location to work for him, more people were leaving at the airport than coming. That was part of the general guerrilla warfare on his, his movies. They were ridden with tension, as opposed to, say, Eastwoods, who have no tension, and he always finishes ahead of time. And I've had experience on both, ample experience on both. But he was very simplistic about the writing. He never let it tyrannize him. Uh, most guys are tortured and they stay up all night and, and the writer and the director go away to Arrowhead and don't let your wife call. And he doesn't, he never insulated himself. Sam was simple. For instance, in The Wild Bunch, he went to dinner at the Holiday House one night and uh, Doc Calvelli, who was a friend of his, said, uh, what do you got, Sam? Sam said, well, I got a problem. I've got the cavalry, the robbers, bank robbers, and the railroad. I got three elements. 
And Calvelli said, well, uh, why don't you get rid of the cavalry? And Sam said, that's great. You broke the back of the story. And if you see the wild bunch, you'll notice there's no cavalry. It's not, it's not overly complex. He also could see right through things, but he didn't want you to, you to know that, that he was any kind of an intellectual because he, he despised the, the whole effete idea of that. He'd say, Sam would say to me, for instance, uh, uh, when people were raving about Duel in the Sun, he said, well, it's excellent, well-wrought soap opera. He didn't put soap opera down. He thought it could be well done. Or he was the only one when people were raving about the sting he walked out of the sting with me and he said, it's a homosexual story about one man and a guy he likes who's not quite a man. He says, well, they were bad to me. So the man, his protector says, well, I'll figure out a fancy caper to embarrass them. Or he came out of Smokey and the Bandit of which Burt Reynolds earned $23 million. And he said, people love it because it's a Roadrunner cartoon with live people. He knew immediately, he didn't damn it but he could x-ray it for you. But the rest of the time, he'd be pugnacious. You'd get him on a, t a show like this, and you'd say, what did that movie mean? He'd say, damned if I know. And his, his, his uh, alumnus, Lee Marvin, was the same way. Didn't want to be a pretender, but he knew. He knew. They both, they both said to me, uh, you know, when people would say, I've heard the camera doesn't lie, Sam and Lee would say, I found the camera doesn't care. <laughs> And they say, what is your technique, Sam? He'd say, it's, it's a series of, um, uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, fallback positions, you know, before I go into full retreat from the authorities that haven't given me ideal working conditions. <laughs> and I like that. I like that. It's very American. And you talk about him being an American and, and uh, dealing with established values, but some would perceive those as very solidly Republican values. Well, they may be, because if we look back on the covered wagon, uh, I don't recall as they fought their way west, any, uh, you know, uh, a representative of, uh, of uh, a liberal sect up on the covered wagon saying to the wagon master, uh, uh, you know, uh, we shouldn't do that to the Indians. You know, and, and when they got off and sang folk songs about traditional and, and yes, religious values, nobody uh, took out in, in the modern context a couch and a desk and interviewed people for entertainment around the campfire. The people could only afford to be liberals after people carved out the frontier. Some of those values, like uh, an eye for an eye and, uh, and justice and that your word means something and you're loyal to the people around you, uh, are conservative values. That is to say, not fascist values. That's really what the, the land baron in uh, Junior Bonner, the difference between a the guys in the covered wagon were conservatives. The other guys are, are fascists. But look at Ford and look at Capra, who is Sam's idol. Look at Capra. Capra is a, an American liberal trying to strike a balance between right-wing actors and left-wing writers. Pretty good balance, by the way. Sam said the compliment he prized the most in his life was when I said he's a 1939 Frank Capra American, which he repeated on the Tom Snyder show. You uh, kept in touch with him on a, on a personal level. Yes. There was a chance of working with him on Alfredo Garcia. Can you tell me that story? But not, not such a great idea to work with him. <laughs> I think it's much better to have the, to have the relationship. He, um, he uh, kept threatening to, uh, and I choose that word carefully, uh, he, uh, he kept threatening to put me to work in movies. And finally he decided that I should play uh, one of the uh, gunmen in uh, Alfredo Garcia, uh, which was, uh, it was uh, me, and then he chose a waiter who was waiting on us at a restaurant called Lafitte's. He's going to make him a movie star, too. I remember warning him. I said, Sam, you know, why don't you let this guy have his wife and family and earn a good living as a waiter? Don't destroy his life making him a hopeful actor. But he did, wouldn't listen to me. And uh, the sadistic side of his nature. Those parts were played in the movie by Robert Weber and Gig Young. So he, he took me to Mexico. And uh, Warren Oates had a fire in his motorhome, and it delayed shooting. And I had a college concert tour, and uh, the 60 colleges I was going to be late to decided to sue me together in a class action suit, no doubt inspired by Ralph Nader, another great populist leader in America. So uh, I was going to be uh, in bondage for the rest of my life, so I left the movie. I called the producer, Marty Baum, and I got out. 
So when I came home, these flowers arrived, these chrysanthemums at my my door, and it said, to a traitor from Sam Peckinpah. <laughs> so my wife sent Sam back a black wreath with no note, and he knew, of course, who it was. And then we didn't speak for about six months. Then he came back to town, and he was more embattled than ever with the establishment. So I figured he needed an ally. So I called him at 20th Century Fox, and he got on the phone, and he said, I just want to know what in the English language you could come up with to bridge the chasm between you and I since you deserted your post. What on earth could you possibly say to get back in my good graces? So I said something inventive like, hello, Sam. And he said, that's it. That's it. That's perfect. <laughs> He's very forgiving, even though he would not like to be characterized that way, I suspect. He liked to be the ringleader. He enjoyed the action off the set, possibly more than on the set. He always rented a house when we went on location, and he'd invite us all over for dinner. He'd always have the best food and the best digs, and that was a way of controlling you after hours. It was really day for night, and sometimes it was night for day. <laughs> there were very black elements working, but uh, but he knew what he was about. I think uh, being drunk was just a cover to have the upper hand, so you'd let your guard down. He respect people he thought were smart. He respected people he thought were actors. He didn't quite respect, and uh, I found him to be a total realist. Maybe all the Michigas quote was trying to avoid the reality he knew all too well. He really knew reality. He was an intimate of reality. The tension. He used that. Everybody. It sort of bled off onto everybody. Tension? Yes, tension. Uh, Chris Christofferson, who's always in top-notch physical condition, he'd say to him, you seem to be gaining weight. He'd say, got to keep him on one foot. Get Allie into a scene in, uh, in, uh, in um, Convoy. Maybe he felt she was too much in control. Stage a fight with Chris during the scene on the set to unnerve her. And as our good friend Steve McQueen said, that doesn't bring you any anything more than more false reactions. It makes women cry and it makes men curse. Is that what you want <laughs> as a director? But he was, uh, uh, that's the kind of thing, uh, you know, yeah, he liked he liked the strategy of tension. Thinking of uh, Sam's period when he was working, one could perceive him perhaps as the last of an old breed of directors or the beginning of a new. How would you see him fitting into that kind of pattern? changing director status. Sam Peckinpah was a logical successor to Ford to take it the next logical step, not revisit it, but somebody who believes in those values and brings them into the 20th century. The same way Clint Eastwood is Jimmy Stewart in 1975. The problem is there isn't anybody after them. Uh, they spoke for their time. That's all an architect can do. Is speak for his time or else the time won't be remembered at all. I think Sam was tremendously misperceived. You hear about how crazy he was, you never hear about the loyalty. Look at the same names on the crawl in every movie. Look at the way he goes out and he gets a scalp and he brings it back and he says, you know, we're all gonna have dinner, in effect. He called everybody, it was always the same people. He, they, they always pointed out when he fought with somebody. But uh, most of the time, he wanted to keep that, uh, that family going and he wanted to keep the idea of the frontier going maybe he was disappointed in what happened after the frontier what do you think drove him i mean we've spoken a little bit about what drove him, but at a certain point there was, there was drink there was drugs all sorts of women there was a he had obviously strong appetites what have you any thoughts about that yeah, he wanted, uh, I think that the intangibles were the only thing tangible in his life. Maybe I understand that because it's very close to my life, but when when Jim Coburn uh, says, when people say, uh, do you have to talk, uh, live movies? Uh, what about real life? Jim says, how do you know what we do on the set isn't real life, and this isn't real life? I think a lot of that was influenced by being a friend of Sam Peckinpah's, and, uh, which he certainly was. and. Uh, I feel the same way. It's the intangibles. 
Sam could get a real enthusiasm up for shooting the next day when he was going to show, he was going to expose the minister or the hypocrite or the land developer or the bad guy was going to get it on Main Street. All of that. I mean, uh, the fantasy. The fantasy. It's what, it's what the movies mean to us in America. I think they're the only documentary evidence that we were any, any better than what you find when you look at us. That's what I think it is. And even though there's a cannibalism in chopping them up and showing them on television, there's no documentation for young people who've never known nobility in this country except those movies. If you can't show them those movies, they don't ever think it was any different. I mean, you, you see them on the air in congressional committees working live at confirmation hearings and uh, talking about everybody being corrupt from uh, Richard Nixon to Tom Jefferson. But Jefferson wasn't. You know, the question still remains unanswered when Jimmy Stewart says, in Mr. Smith, he says to the collective press, when are you going to tell the American people the truth? When are they going to trust the American people with the truth? Do you think that uh, his final years relate to that and the fact that um, he found it very difficult to work? Can you talk a bit about this? Well, of course, it was becoming corporate Hollywood. I don't know how easy it is for anybody uh, creative to work. For a guy to come out of a trailer with his headband on and create that whole world of illusion, which is what he could do, there aren't too many guys that can do that. The people that can't do it, the money men, who have to hitch a ride with you, have got to hate you. You can fly and they can't. And he d didn't disguise his contempt for them, which uh, didn't strike them the right way. They would like to abscond with the creative man's ideas and give them to their friends whom they can control. They didn't think they could control Sam. They might have been, they might have been right. All I know is those, the movie Sam made still get the hair up on the back of your neck. I don't know how many, too many movies I could go to tonight that'll do that for me. Do you think towards the end he was kind of on, um auto-destruct, so to speak, or was it that the establishment was finally got him? Well, you know, I've heard the term in Hollywood, self-destructive, since I recognize the English language. But it seems to me that uh, this being a full-service society, there are plenty of people that will do it for you. <laughs> They're well ahead of you in line and on priority numbers. There were plenty of, of people laying for him, and don't forget what he reminded them of. He reminded them of a better day, which they sold out for 30 pieces of silver. Whether they did it uh, to the Japanese or corporate barons in New York or this phantom they call public taste, whatever they call it, they don't fight for a better view. I mean, who the hell would go with an empty slate to England and make straw dogs and reach people all over the world with it? He wanted, he had, he had it in the back of his mind that maybe they're not so civilized over there. Maybe they're not the fathers of civility. He struck a blow for Americans, universally understood. It's a sure sign of art. I don't think Sam would like to be called an artist, but you know, the, I suppose there's nothing he can do about it now. He just told the truth, but that's what all artists do. How do you think you'll be remembered? For the work. The work will stand and uh, people will wonder what drove him to do that because they can't muster they say demon you know as critics say demons drove them they should muster such demons maybe they could produce something it's strong it says that you know uh men who believe in something can beat men who believe in nothing that's what those movies say and don't forget sam went to the movies and i dare say it's not just that we take from other people. The mark of distinction is that who we take from. What, it's not just that you believe in God, it's what God do you kneel before? I think that he believed in Ford. And I think Ford believed in common people. I mean, look at those, look at those, uh, Sam, for instance, was very fond of the speech in Ford Apache, where they say, uh, well, many men died in, you know, Custer's last stand, in effect. 
And uh, John Wayne says, they're not dead. They're out there riding wherever the 7th Cavalry is. The names change, the faces change, but they still wear dirty soldier blue and they live on beans and bacon. But wherever they rode, that became the United States. He believes it. He believed it. Sam believed it. And the proof is that there's no seam between Ford and Peckinpah, except maybe the code are, and uh, not without his critics, you know, uh, Howard Hawks said to me, Sam's convinced me that some of these guys need killing, but why do it in slow motion? If a guy deserves killing, kill the SOB, <laughs> which means he was taken in by the picture. <laughs> That's over my head, you know, because I don't have the skills of Howard Hawks or Sam Peckinpah or John Ford. I can just be part of the audience. I mean, that's my involvement, essentially, is that I was there witnessing the picture. Remember, too, that Sam originally found the authentic death of Henry Jones and almost directed Marlon Brando in it as one-eyed jacks. He influenced what that picture came to be. Possibly one of the five best all-time westerns, or three, the most romantic, certainly, of all of them ever made. And... Uh, and that he was trying to get in position to do Eastwood and Wayne in like the last Western toward the end. But of course, they were all scared of him. What's he gonna be like? He'll be a terror on the set. You know, he wanted that reputation, but then everybody thought they'd have to come to the set with a chair and a whip and a gun. <laughs> but I had to say to them, hey, what, that little guy? Not him. <laughs> Do you think that uh, what was happening in America, particularly Vietnam and so on, actually got through to him? Was he worried by that? Did he perceive that America had changed and was fighting wars that it shouldn't be in? Oh yeah, he uh, he understood that. Uh, he understood that totally. But he also operated on a, a more uh, Sam operated on a uh, a visceral level. I was always abstracting him to the intellectual level, but he was on the the, the visceral level of, um, you know, he was a guy who could. Uh, look at Gore Vidal and say, he says all the right things, why don't I believe him? He's still a director. More than a writer, although a damn good writer. I mean, he saw the essentials. You know, he saw what an extraneous scene was. He told me if you can pull any scene out of a movie and it won't be missed, it didn't belong there in the first place. And he could prove it to you. And he could cut anything to where it still had its skeletal structure. He could take a three-hour movie and cut it to a half-hour television show for you. It might be abrupt, but it still said the same thing. Maybe a lot of what the powers that be didn't like about Peck and Paw was that you couldn't cut them. Even when they fired them and banished them to northern Iceland and had the final cut, they couldn't do anything about it. He was always fond of uh, the image I had about that. He was always talking about castration. I'd say, they have the final cut. He always liked that joke because it was brutal, it was merciless toward him. It is a cruel joke. If he was back here now... Yes. And you could say something to him, what would you say? Uh... Well, I would say, uh... Things have gotten worse since you departed, my friend. And everything you said was true. But among the other things you said, at the highest moments of despair, Sam, you said to me, they may kill us, but they won't eat us. And that came true too. Cut.